Hello, amazing listeners. Welcome to another episode of the Boo Business Podcast, the unscripted show where we unveil, demystify some of the confusing parts of birth, breastfeeding, and infant care during the first year of life while having a little fun. I'm your host, Naomi Catron, registered nurse and board certified lactation consultant. Our mission here is simple, to foster collaboration in maternal child health and empower both families and businesses alike. We're all about creating a community where everyone feels supported and informed. In each episode, we dive deep into engaging discussions that span the entire spectrum of birth through the first year. From newborn feeding, because let's face it, it's something we all have got questions about, to tackling issues like tongue ties, the mysteries of pacifiers, mental health, body work, and just so much more. So whether you're a new parent now, Navigating the incredible journey of early parenthood or a seasoned professional in the birth business, this podcast is your go-to source for laughter, knowledge, and some great insights. So we're here to make learning about boob business not just informative, but enjoyable. So join us for conversations that not only spark your curiosity, but also bring a smile to your face. So remember, every episode is a chance to connect, learn, and share. So hit the subscribe button and let's embark on this exciting journey together. Hey there, guys. Uh, Today, we have the privilege of having an amazing nurse practitioner and functional medicine specialist on our show. Her name is Elise Clark. So a little bit about her. She's a a nurse practitioner. She's dedicated to functional medicine. She has a passion for functional medicine while focusing on treating the whole person and covering the root causes of health concerns. She has a personalized and realistic approach to healthcare. Um, So she creates custom treatment plans tailored to each patient's unique needs. She practices both in Texas and Colorado through uh, telemedicine, making her expertise accessible to a wide range of patients. Um, In addition to her work in healthcare, Elise is a wife and a proud mom of two little boys, and she's expecting again. Um, She places her family at the center of her life, and she's deeply committed to educating her patients and helping them achieve more functional and balanced lifestyles. So I am going to have her on the show right now. I just wanted to give you a little brief introduction to her. She also has been my healthcare provider for the last year, and I've had great... um, results from working with her. And I thought that a lot of her specialty in hormones and nutrition could be really helpful to our audience. So with no further ado, let's get in and chat with Elise. Hey, Elise, this is Elise, our special guest, everyone. How are you? I'm great. Good morning, Naomi. How are you? I'm doing terrific. Thank you so much for being on our show. I know a lot of families ask me a lot of questions about hormone and Mm -hmm. nutrition. And I've had a wonderful experience working with you over the last year. So I figured Thank I could pull you. you in and pick you up and we can share some of um, the things that you specialize in with our audience. Yeah, I appreciate uh, it. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? Like your, yeah. your kind of like clinical background? Yeah. So I'm a nurse practitioner and I am certified to see families, but I really don't see anyone under 18 anymore. I mostly deal with adults. Um, And I started out in family practice, which I think gave me a really good foundation. And then really quickly found my interest was in hormones. So went the more traditional endocrinology route, but then realized I wasn't able to help people quite as much as I wanted to. So then I always say functional medicine kind of found me through that pathway because I was like, what else could I be doing? Um, And so I ended up in functional medicine, really focusing on hormone balancing, women's health. I see men too, but obviously as a woman, I have a a special place in my heart for women. Um, And so looking at the whole hormone landscape and nutrient deficiencies, gut health, looking at the whole picture with stress and lifestyle. So I try to do a really well-rounded approach, but it's kind of like I I weaved my way into this functional medicine world and still have a really big emphasis on hormones. And then a lot of my background as a nurse prior to getting my master's was in women's health. So that kind of stuck with me as well. I love that. I actually... It was interesting how I came to find you. I did an episode. Oh, I wish I could remember the title of it, but I had a guest on discussing um, hormones and lactation and how it can affect lactation. I'm trying to type in my 
podcast so I can find out which episode it was. Um, she's just an amazing speaker. She's a TEDx speaker. And so it made me, so some of the things she was saying is episode 37, hormones and milk supply, what you need to know. And it had to do with like a fascinating intersection of hormone changes in your life, like in your 30s and 40s, mm-hmm. and then breastfeeding. Um, and so our guest was Laurel Wins- Wilson. And she introduced this term to me called the um, astrobolome. And I was like, is this a word that you made up or is this a real word? And she's like, no, I didn't make it up. It's a real word. And I was like, oh, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> and she was talking to me about some things on the podcast that was really geared toward breastfeeding women in their you know, mid to late 30s and 40s. And I thought to myself, oh, I should probably get myself checked out because I'm yeah. having some of these kind of symptoms. So I talked to her offline and she told me I should look for a functional health provider. And there's some some labs that can be done that you do that functional health providers look at differently because mm-hmm. many times our hormones that we take, if you go to OBGYN and they test your hormones, it's in an isolated period of time and it may not be the whole picture of what's going on. And so I went through a deep search and then I ended up found, finding you and I've had a wonderful experience working with you over the last year and I feel much, much better. Yeah. Um, but for our audience, a lot of them you know, are postpartum or prenatal and they're having some challenges like with thyroid. Like this mm-hmm. is a really big common thing. So I know you've mentioned that thyroid health during and after pregnancy is something you love talking about. Yeah. Can you explain how pregnancy and the postpartum period can impact a woman's thyroid health and what symptoms our listeners should be aware of? Yeah. So uh, pregnancy is obviously a big time for growth in the body. It, we expand, a baby is growing, we're developing a whole new life. And Thyroid hormone is one of, and there's a few different ones, but T4 and T3 are the main ones. And those are very important for all of our metabolic processes. And your metabolism obviously ramps up significantly when you're growing a baby. And then afterwards, when you're trying to recover from that and then feed a baby. So your demand for thyroid hormone actually increases by at least 30%. And so if you're starting from a place where you have a thyroid condition prior to pregnancy, you often need to increase your medication dose. And then for those of us who may have a propensity to thyroid issue, or maybe we were a little bit borderline to begin with, we can end up with low thyroid function during pregnancy and sometimes afterwards. So it's really about with a thyroid, it's a metabolic center. And when you heighten your metabolism so much with something like pregnancy and breastfeeding, your thyroid needs to make more hormone. And if you're healthy, that's wonderful. Your body does it for you. But there's so many other factors like pre-existing conditions, um, stress, nutrient deficiencies that come along with pregnancy that can sometimes actually make it more likely for you to develop a thyroid problem, especially during pregnancy. Um, we are actually a lot more likely to develop a thyroid issue during pregnancy or after. And it's interesting because the we call it thyroiditis, where your thyroid gland can get enlarged and then not function as properly. And for a lot of women, if you're healthy at baseline, that actually resolves itself after postpartum several months. But it does make you more likely to develop something like Hashimoto's, an autoimmune thyroid issue later in the future. So about 20% of those women that get thyroiditis just related to pregnancy will be more likely to develop a thyroid issue later in life. So it's when you look at all the research and what happens in the body, the thyroid is so important. And it's I don't want to say it's a finicky gland because it's really pretty resilient. But in those periods where we're having so many hormone shifts outside of the thyroid, it can make your thyroid kind of stressed to the point where it can't recover. What are some of the symptoms that someone suffering from thyroiditis would have? And is that something that needs treatment or do you just a lot kind of, of times, watch and wait? Sometimes you can watch and wait if things are borderline. Um, but if that's the case, you're typically not feeling very good anyway. So you might want to opt for treatment for at least a short period of time. Um, typically, the symptoms are going to be, and this is hard to differentiate with pregnancy and postpartum fatigue, <laughs> hair falling out, gaining weight. Um, some of those processes are very normal in that period of time. But I 
I always say it's more extreme than that. It's I I know I'm not sleeping as well because I have a baby, but I still can't get out of bed. I am more puffy. So weight, of course, is a big topic around pregnancy and postpartum. But with thyroid issues, a lot of times your face actually looks a little bit more puffy. You're hanging on to more fluid. It's not quite the moon face that we see with adrenal issues, but you can just tell like you're you're your face just looks rounder a little bit. And so I always tell my patients, if you even have an inkling that something is wrong, you just get it checked. It's a, such an easy test to run for your thyroid. And that way you just know for sure. Um, but another more kind of nuanced one, especially in that postpartum period, would really be mood issues. Because if you're low on your thyroid, even borderline, you're more prone to anxiety and depression. And then you add on the massive hormone dips that happen after delivery with estrogen and progesterone, and mood issues can really be heightened. So if you are experiencing a lot of postpartum depression or anxiety, checking your thyroid should be at the top of the list too. Okay. Now, when you say checking your thyroid, so a lot of times as lactation consultants, we do, you know, a history of thyroid issues or any endocrine, endocrine issues could be a risk factor for having challenges with milk mm -hmm. supply. Um, and so sometimes we wish that we could be the ones to run labs, like, yeah. you know, whatever, your TSH and your T3 and your T4, but that's not within our scope. So then we sometimes ask, like, hey, can you ask your P your um, OB to run some labs? And then they'll run, like, just a TSH, mm -hmm. which is, you know, like, it, okay. But tell, okay. You're the expert. Yeah. <laughs> tell us if someone was concerned that their thyroid was a little out of whack in their postpartum, what labs or how should they speak to the provider to really find out? Yeah. I would like via labs what's going on. Yes. And now, you know, patients are, we have a lot more access to education, whether thanks to the internet and also, I mean, social media, the internet has its downsides, but also has some really good positives like getting educated. So I would ask for, if you're looking for a thyroid panel, a TSH, which is the brain signal that goes from your pituitary gland to the thyroid and helps to regulate how much hormone the body's going to produce. I would do that. I would do a free T4 and a free T3 because those levels are going to show what's biologically available. And those are the considered the two active hormones, but T4 is 300 times less activating than T3 for our metabolism. So it's really considered more of the pro-hormone. So if you're just looking at the T4, that's better than nothing, you know, but I would say you need that T3 as well because there's least about 20% of us that don't convert T4 into the very active hormone T3 very well. And that can be heightened during pregnancy and postpartum as well. So to see what's getting in the cells and how your brain is regulating that gland, you really need at least all three of those. And then if there's any suspicion in your mind that you could have developed Hashimoto's or an autoimmune issue, or you just need that peace of mind, the two other tests that you would ask for would be thyroglobulin and thyroid peroxidase antibodies. And that would show if for some reason during this heightened stressful time in your body, your immune system started attacking your thyroid gland. And unfortunately, because of some of the immune changes that happen during pregnancy, some of them are upregulating, some of them are downregulating. It makes sense because we don't want to try to fight off our baby. So our immune system does actually right. go down in some ways. But there's really big thinking that that's why women are more prone to Hashimoto's and autoimmune issues, especially during pregnancy and postpartum. So our immune system is not working quite as well. Then you add on nutrient deficiencies and emotional stress, and then it's kind of like this perfect storm for increased autoimmunity. So long way of saying TSH, T4, and T3 in their free forms would be the basics. And then those two antibodies, if you were curious about Hashimoto's. Okay, that's fantastic. When is it appropriate to look at reversed? You did a reversed lab on me, yeah. reversed T3 or something? I don't know. All I know is that whatever you did, I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there I'm a nurse and I like never, you did a full panel uh -huh. of lots of different things. I'm in a different, I'm older and I have different issues, but I was like, I have never heard of these labs before. <laughs> Your labs were able to tell me if my cholesterol 
was sticky or not sticky right. enough. The particle and like sizes. if that was a certain risk for Alzheimer's mm-hmm. and all these things, I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. It's, I'm sorry. It's like, <laughs> it's the more you know, right? The rainbow from PBS. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so a reverse T3 typically is going to go up in times of increased inflammation in the body. And by nature, you know, pregnancy and postpartum are pretty inflammatory processes, even though it's an appropriate thing. So I would say during those periods of time, reverse T3 isn't going to give me as much information because I would probably expect it to be a little bit higher. Um, But if we're talking about outside of those times, a reverse T3 is great to look at in combination with those just because your T4 molecule has two options. It can convert into the active T3 and really boost your metabolism and do all the good work, or it can convert into reverse T3, which is a biologically inactive thyroid hormone. So in theory, it doesn't do anything, but it does sit on the receptor sites that T3 want to enter. So it acts like a Mm. goalie if you have too much. So there really is kind of this ratio of reverse T3 to free T3 that we look at. But again, I think during pregnancy and postpartum, that reverse T3 is going to be a little bit a little bit more misleading in my opinion sure, sure. and not meaning we sh- it's worthless. Um, but we know there's certain times in life when we're recovering from illness, recovering from surgery in an, in an appropriate inflamed state that your reverse T3 should actually be a little bit higher. So I do check it, but not as, not as frequently in that period. Okay. That makes sense. Cause I'm not postpartum yeah. clearly. So that's why <laughs> you were we pregnant. My- <laughs> no, no, long, long, long time ago. Um, tell us, so if you find an abnormality with these labs, you know, do patients have to start taking levothyroxine and medication right away? Or is this more like a supplement type thing? Yeah. What, what happens next? Typically, if it's during pregnancy, we're going to encourage people to take medication because of how important thyroid hormones are to fetal development. So if you're even on that border, and this is even in the traditional setting as well, if you're yeah. borderline yeah, TSH, sure. borderline T4, they're going to put you on a little boost of thyroid medication to ensure that one, you feel good, but also that your baby develops appropriately. Um, And so your doctor will typically check at least a TSH at the beginning of your pregnancy. And then if you start to develop symptoms, you can check it more periodically. Um, But the traditional method is to do levothyroxine or Synthroid. That's the branded version. It's just T4. So your body will have to convert all of that into the T3 that it needs. And most people do pretty good with Synthroid. If you're still having residual symptoms or your numbers don't change enough, then we start to add on more of that combination therapy where we add in T3. Um, Very safe in pregnancy, but not a lot of OBs are as familiar with it. So I would say in general, what you're going to see is that if something happens with your thyroid, you'll probably be put on levothyroxine or Synthroid by your OB. Okay. And then postpartum wise, what does that look like? Um, Postpartum, I would say same, actually, just because you need so much of those thyroid hormones to produce breast milk and recover. So probably if you're going the OB route, like more traditional model, they would start you on levothyroxine or Synthroid. Um, If it's my patient, I typically go ahead and start on combination T4 and T3, just because it does really help boost up the residual symptoms helps more with fatigue, hair loss, skin, weight. So that combination typically helps. Milk supply? Yeah, probably. We're always looking for milk supply stuff. (laughs) Yes, it should help more with that because that is the biologically active thyroid hormone. And if you look at it and you're converting the levothyroxine just fine into T3 and you feel good, that's a great option. Um, Okay, okay. I just, I typically think I attract the patients who aren't doing as well on that. So they're seeking another alternative. So my experience is most of my patients are on the combination. Yeah. Yeah. And again, very safe. Uh, We just watch the numbers, make sure they don't get too high. But T3 can be pretty life-changing for your metabolism. And then your your breast milk. (laughs) Yeah. I don't care about breast milk. Well, as a lactation consultant, I do. But as a for- mid-40s person, I do not. But I did come to you. One of my symptoms was weight gain and hair loss. And I take T3. I don't have. I don't take levothyroxine. I don't have any other TSH issues. My other labs are totally normal. But just to show you, typical normal labs look normal. You do some more involved labs. And you're like, oh, I think there might be room for 
improvement if we add some T3 and it, yeah. it's amazing. It's totally. Yeah. It's a wonderful save my hair. hormone. I was going to be bald. I was going to be like, oh my gosh, what is happening here? This is terrible. I felt like a postpartum mom yeah. while their hair is starting to come out in the shower. And I was like, this is inconsistent with the stage of life I'm in. Or maybe I thought I was menopausal and I'm not. So it was very helpful. I mean, because some of our listeners, well, yes, they are postpartum moms, but we have all the people who care for postpartum yeah. moms and doulas and lactation consultants, and they might be more at my phase of life. Yeah. Um, so that's really, really... It's really helpful. Tell me, you also, I know we've done a lot of things with nutrition. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about nutrition deficiencies during postpartum and the breastfeeding period. Like many yeah. moms don't realize how nutrient deficiencies can affect their postpartum recovery yeah. and breastfeeding. So maybe you can, if you can highlight some common nutrient deficiencies that you see in postpartum women and maybe how they can address these through diet or supplementation. Yeah, I would say the number one thing, if, if, you hear nothing else in your postpartum, it's keep taking your prenatal vitamin. I think the name really throws people off. They say it says prenatal. So you assume afterwards, like, oh, I don't need all that anymore. I'm, done. Yeah. I'm not growing a human, but now you're feeding a human and your body is trying to recover, even if you're not breastfeeding. So the most common nutrient deficiencies related to, especially thyroid, but then being able to produce breast milk, produce energy, and feel your best would probably be selenium, zinc. Um, iodine is really important for thyroid production. Um, I really commonly see low iron and low protein. So you need those amino acids that you get from protein intake, which you could take, you know, a collagen powder, you could get an amino acid supplement, but you have to be fueling your body. And the best way to do that is with food, right? So I think in terms of nutrition, emphasizing protein intake and healthy fat intake is huge for your body's recovery, but also being able to have enough extra nutrients to feed your baby. Um, right. And we often don't eat enough because we're tired. We're trying to figure it out. None of us know what we're doing at first. You know, it's, it's yeah. chaos for a little bit, um, but you have to be eating consistently and you have to, if nothing else, focus on the protein and the fat. Um, and then with the more micronutrient aspect, like iron and selenium and those types of things, your prenatal will really help you with that. And it's important to think about what just happened. You delivered a baby, whether it was by C-section or vaginally, and you lost a lot of blood. And so that iron's going to be depleted. I don't care who you are. It's going to be depleted. Right. So you need to keep taking that prenatal at minimum. And then if you have a lot of issues or symptoms with recovery, then you can have your doctor check you for some levels like the iron and the at least vitamin D, some basics like that and supplement appropriately. But in terms of getting super fancy with stuff, um, I would say prenatal is really your best bet and the DHA, you know, any kind of omegas that you were taking, keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. That's really helpful. When it comes to the nutrition point on the lactation side of things, um, your breast milk composition is going to remain steady with the nutrient composition regardless of the mom's diet. So your breast milk is not going to be more fatty because you're eating um, more olive more oil fat, yeah. or Big Macs, right? <laughs> like, and so those are two totally different kinds of fats too. Yeah. However, the fat composition, the quality of the fat in your breast milk is... Um, you know, it can be determined by what your diet is. So people who are, let's say, in Japan and they eat more fish or um, even Alaska where they might have like whale blubber and things like that, mm -hmm. you'll notice their breast milk composition has a much higher quality um, fat content that than maybe so cool. an American yeah. person living somewhere else that might be eating. Like mid middle America. <laughs> yeah, like fatty processed foods. Yeah. Um, or someone who lives in sub-Saharan Africa, like their milk content is going to be the same percentage of fat, protein, and sugars as someone who lives in Japan, but the quality of fat mm -hmm. is going to be different. And the reason I share that is because your baby is going to suck the life out of you if you are not supplementing <laughs> yourself. So yes. it's not like you're going to starve your baby if you're not eating your own protein, but all you are actually doing is causing yourself in the long run to be more feeble. Yeah. And I don't know if feeble is the right word, but... Um, we'll just lower like your muscle bones, mass. 
muscle mass yeah. and and like people have a lot of issues with their teeth after they finish oh, pregnancy or nursing because their baby does remove all the calcium from you yeah. so you do need to make sure you're eating and taking a calcium pill is not the best way to do it it's actually supplementing with food and mm-hmm. i learned from you how much protein is actually required which was it's a lot. really hard. It's hard but you did give me really good tips like you were like this is like a really cool shake that you can have that doesn't because i'm also I'm a total diva, so I don't want like nasty things like powdery, chalky, <laughs> yeah. and I'm not going to eat a, not drinking a big pill. Like yeah. I'm not doing it, but I, I can honestly say like, I'm really good now. I get at least my hundred grams good. of protein in a day. Um, and I know I'm a little heavier, so I might need a little more than that, but that went from maybe 50 grams of protein a day to now. Yeah. I did 40 just this morning for my breakfast and it was really that easy. Is and pretty that good. was really <laughs> helping you guys really, really helped me a lot with that. But I do notice a lot of my postpartum moms are snacking on like granola bars yeah. and, um, well, I feel I like know. as a, when I was postpartum with my son, if you Google what foods help with breast milk, oh, yeah. so much it's of like, it that comes up oatmeal, is just like oatmeal yeah. and you're Carbs. like, okay. Yeah. Um, so those things are fine, but you have to pair them with protein and with fat. You can't just eat a granola bar and then feel good because you're going to get a massive sugar dump later and yes. you're not going to feel good. Be tired, be tired. Yeah. And it is hard to eat enough. I know that I have a two and a half year old. I was just there, have the next one coming in December. So all this is very top of mind for me and how I'm going to prepare and how I'm going to plan. But when I... I saw this very firsthanded with my first because we, my husband and I actually got COVID right after we had him and we had a stomach version, so we couldn't eat oh. for about a week. I almost ate nothing. It was horrible. Um, but to your point about breast milk composition, my son got fat as can be and was great. And I kept feeding him, but I ended up losing so much muscle mass. <laughs> That's an extreme mm-hmm. example. But I still, I mean, I still have not gained all that muscle back because your body, it does, it gives it all to your baby, which is wonderful. I suffered a little bit, but it was, <laughs> <laughs> but he was great. So I was great. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, all that to highlight the importance of consistent intake, you know, eating every two to three hours when you're breastfeeding, probably when you're pregnant too, the whole time is really important. And then just the protein and fat intake. Yeah. Yeah. I just very, the nutrition part of things has been so fascinating to me um, and how you can feel so much better when yeah. you get your nutrition from whole foods. However, it is really hard to figure it out. But once you find your mojo, and I did have a lot of help from you. Uh, You guys have a nutrition coach. Mm -hmm. She's wonderful. Yeah. So I was like, oh, now I know how to get my 40 grams of um, protein in the morning. Like she introduced me to this protein powder that I put in my coffee and it, you cannot tell it's there. I was putting collagen in my coffee coffee before and it was tasting grainy. Mm -hmm. Um, But she put me onto this protein that I can put in my coffee and I get my 20 grams there. And then I have this protein bar that I like that she helped I help me figure it out. Yeah. And there's my 40 gram. And that's even if I don't have time to scramble eggs and make a little omelet. Cause yeah. I'm like, how many eggs can a person eat? You know, I agree. It gets a little bit old. Or if you're vegan. Yeah. And yeah. You have to diversify. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. So um, that's been really helpful because it does help to prevent those crashes. Mm -hmm. Um, But you also have to live in the real world. We can't sit like, I don't have time to sit and make these meals that you see on Instagram all day long every day. Like, yeah, you have to take care of your actual kids. (laughs) (laughs) Some people make it look like they do. So I mean, I just thought practical advice that you guys give to real life people. It's not like one size fits all. It was like, this is your life. This is how long your commute is. This is when you have access to a microwave or a stove or whatever was very helpful to me. Um, And since you're going through this phase of life right now and preparing for postpartum hood coming up soon for you, I I made a mistake on the introduction. You have one baby and then you have another one that's coming on the introduction. I said you had two, but, but you're going to, you're going to be a mom of two boys soon. Yes. Um, Tell me what you would um, encourage people to mentally start prepping for. Yeah. So what advice would you give a pregnant woman to prepare themselves for the hormone and physical changes that come after delivery and like how to prep for that? Yeah. I think to me, the biggest thing, and I tried to do this with my first, but you obviously have no idea what you're doing, um, was just know what my body is going to go through so that I can mentally prepare and maybe have some more grace for myself. 
when you're pregnant, your estrogen and progesterone are super high. And that typically makes you feel bad in the beginning. That's theoretically why we get a lot of the nausea. But as you get into that second and third trimester, it usually makes us feel pretty good. We get our energy back. Our mood is typically okay in pregnancy because that progesterone makes us really happy. But then whenever you deliver, as soon as that placenta comes out, your progesterone drops almost to nothing within a day and your estrogen, same thing. And that birthing process causes your prolactin to go up, which is what ultimately leads to breast milk production, which is wonderful, but it go, it's a massive shift, low testosterone to high prolactin. And then the high prolactin, the goal is to produce breast milk, but at the same time, or sorry. You said testosterone. Did you mean testosterone or progesterone? No, sorry. I meant progesterone. Okay. <laughs> progesterone like, and estrogen. Okay. Sorry. Progesterone goes down. down prolactin yeah. goes up. Yeah. And then that prolactin, of course, is great for the breastfeeding aspect of it, but it suppresses your ovarian production of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So you're basically in a postmenopausal state of hormones while you're breastfeeding mm. for at least the first six months or so until you start ovulating again. Some people it's longer, you know, some people it's closer to a year before they ovulate and their hormones pick back up. But usually when you start to wean a little bit more and feed less and solids are introduced, that prolactin level drops some and your estrogen and progesterone can pick back up. But I say all that because the massive drop in progesterone and estrogen is what leads to a lot of the baby blues, the mood issues, the dysregulated sleep. It can cause spikes in your cortisol because progesterone and cortisol have this kind of balancing relationship where when one's low, the other one can have more opportunity to be high. So that's part of why we feel like we're always on edge after pregnancy. And then the other part is mm. we are wired <laughs> to keep this baby alive. So it's that fight or flight constantly of, is there a threat of danger? Is, you know, does the baby need something? And then you don't have those calming hormones, estrogen and progesterone around. So I think just knowing like, hey, I'm gonna go through this massive hormonal shift. I'm gonna cut myself some slack if I have a crappy day or my mood is really wacky. I'm gonna take some time and evaluate what's going on. Is this something I'm really concerned about? Or is this something more that feels like a hormone shift that's going to settle itself out? So I know I kind of bring up all the mood issues related to that because I do feel like that's a huge trigger for postpartum depression and anxiety. Um, I mean, it's in the research. But it can also be triggers for you know, just other things like not sleeping as well, even if your baby is sleeping, weight remaining an issue. Um, one of the other things that we don't talk about as much when it comes to hormones in pregnancy is your insulin is actually very high during pregnancy. So insulin is a huge topic right now. Insulin resistance is probably one of our biggest problems in America worldwide, but definitely in America. And what that means is your body isn't using this hormone that helps regulate sugar well. And when you're pregnant, it's a growth hormone. So it naturally is going to go up to grow your baby, grow your placenta, actually grow breast tissue as well. And for most of us, if we're starting from a really healthy place, that insulin goes back down to normal. We become sensitive to it again right after delivery and everything's fine. But if you're starting out with some insulin resistance from PCOS, borderline blood sugars, metabolic issues, then that insulin resistance can remain and it can make it a lot harder for you to lose weight and get back to your baseline metabolic function. So I think talking about the female hormones is great because it can help you understand your mood and your sleep cycle and why you always feel edgy. But the other part is your metabolism with that insulin, we have to make sure that that gets sensitized again and figure out if that is a long-term problem for you. And that can offer some more grace with yourself in terms of why is my weight not coming off? You know, why do I not feel like my composition is back? Well, after a few months, let's check your insulin and see what's going on. Is it still really high? Do we need to address that too? Um, so to me, a lot of it is about education and mentally knowing what to what physiologically is happening. So then you can cut yourself some slack. Um, one of the things I'm doing this time that I didn't do last time is I'm a huge proponent of therapy. I think everyone needs therapy, right? Um, and so I've been seeing someone who specializes in postpartum to come up with a plan. 
you know, this is a whole new experience. I'm starting my own business. I have a two and a half year old. It's just a whole different phase of life. And I wanted to be better prepared. So we have a whole postpartum plan that we're working on of how I'm going to take care of myself, how I'm going to spend time with my son, my husband, who's going to help me, um, stuff like that. So I think also either doing that through counseling or just finding a postpartum plan online that you can fill out and talk to your partner about is really helpful. Um, So I think to sum it up, I know I rambled, but I think to sum it up, it's fantastic. (laughs) I think to sum it up, let's let's educate ourselves on what's going on with our body. And then let's come up with at least a tentative plan, like hold it loosely, but have some ideas of what you're going to do to take care of yourself. Otherwise you're going to go crazy for a while. (laughs) Yeah, what I heard you, I mean, there's so many things. The first thing I was going to say is, we, I do have a whole episode, episode 23, called Breaking the Stigma on Maternal Mental Health, where I interview um, one of the co uh, the COO, I think is her title, Nichelle Haynes, Dr. Nichelle Haynes at Reproductive Psychiatry Center of Austin. Um, and that's a huge, that's what I was just about to say is like, getting someone on board while you're still pregnant is going to be really helpful. Um, because you, it's hard to know what is, is this just hormones or is this like now my permanent new depressed state? So that's really challenging for you to figure out on your own. Um, But I think exactly what you said is the first thing I hear is your partner should listen to this episode basically. So they know (laughs) what to expect, but you're just, you're not not crazy. Your hormones are crazy. (laughs) Yes. And and like understand it's not just like a two week thing or a six week thing. Once you go back to for your six week checkup, like it's a little bit longer than that. So that was the first thing that came to my mind is like husbands, partners, this is episode is for you. Um, The second thing I heard you say is knowledge is power. So knowing that progesterone and um, prolactin have an inverse relationship, but also ha- their effect on mood and estrogen. Mm-hmm. So that you're actually basically like a postpartum, a post menopausal woman right. while you're nursing. Yeah, is is so it's crazy. It's just, when you no think one about said it. that to me. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I'm not depressed. Is this what the rest of your life is when you're no? And post- also, I will what say, <laughs> post menopausal. When you get to post menopause, <laughs> also come see me because we can talk about hormones and that that situation too. But. It's important to know that this temporary state postpartum while you're breastfeeding and you're not having periods, like you are basically postmenopausal. And then the other thing that can happen, which again, I am I totally willing to share my whole life story, is that you can get <laughs> you and I both yeah, you can get a lot of menopausal symptoms like major vaginal dryness and more propensity yes, a- to urinary tract infections. And it's because you're vaginal tissue and your bladder, the urethral opening that goes through that vaginal canal, it needs estrogen to be healthy and well moisturized and keep bacteria at bay. So if you're struggling with majorly low libido, painful intercourse, a lot of UTIs in that postpartum period, you can blame the lack of estrogen and you can actually do things to help it. You can do vaginal estrogen for a little while. does not impact your breast milk production because it's just locally in that vaginal tissue. But when I went postpartum, my OB is really funny. I was like, I I don't know. Like, I just can't really tell what's going on down there. Because, I mean, I know what I... I know things, but when it comes to yourself, it's so hard to see yourself clearly. And he was so funny. He was like, well, it's because you kind of have like a postmenopausal vagina. And I was like, thanks. Appreciate that. (laughs) So again, sorry, TMI. But I say that because that happens really to everybody. And some women can, you know, their body compensates a little better than others. Um, But I thought that was really funny. And also did some vaginal estrogen. Everything was great. And then, good. yeah. Okay. And then one of the other tricks is, and you have to be a little careful with breast milk production in the beginning, but for postpartum depression, anxiety, one of the things that I will commonly do is a little bit of progesterone. So if you do really low doses, like 25 milligrams, either once or twice a day, you can do them in these dissolving tablets that go under your tongue. Because typically progesterone, if we supplement with it, it makes you sleepy. So we have you take it at night, but that's the pill version. 
And if you do the kind that you chew and dissolve in your mouth, it doesn't make you sleepy, but it can add a little more progesterone because you're not making any. And it actually helps produce GABA in your brain, which is a neurotransmitter that helps with calming. So most of what I see in patients is they're looking for that alternative to an SSRI or, or whatever, which I'm yeah. not against at all. But I think that um, that's also something to consider if there's major mood issues is maybe there is a little hormone aspect that we can treat as long as your breast milk production is good. Well, that actually, that's very interesting mm-hmm. because tell me what the difference between that and someone going at their six-week checkup and their doctor talking to them about birth control and putting them on a mini pill, which is a progesterone-only right. pill. Is it similar or totally different? Um, it's similar. And if you talk to people in the hormone world, they would probably call that blasphemy because progestins oh, okay. <laughs> are what are in mini pills and birth control pills and uh-huh. progesterone is the bioidentical or naturally produced version so chemically if you look at their structure they're different so progestins are more like a man-made hormone and they will bind to the same receptors as progesterone but not fully so you don't get the same yeah max benefit. So that's how birth control pills work is they actually trick your pituitary gland into thinking that you're getting these outside sources of these good hormones. So it further shuts down your pituitary gland. So you are getting a little bit of a physiological benefit from the fake progesterone called progestin. So it can alleviate some symptoms. Sometimes it does help with mood, but it's definitely going to keep you from ovulating and you're still not going to make any progesterone or estrogen while you're on it. So your ovaries are still going to be dormant. Whereas if you're doing something like progesterone, the bioidentical version, it's just going to add what your body naturally would be making or is making, and we're just adding a little bit to it. And it binds to those receptor sites fully and produces more of that good physiological benefit that we're after with brain health, mood, sleep, Um, you know, if you're having periods, regularity there, less PMS. So they are kind of similar, but if we're talking about getting benefits from taking a progesterone, the mini pill is not going to get you where you need to be in terms of mood at all. Okay. That's really interesting to know. And I love that you're cognizant enough to know, to counsel the patient, hey, let's watch your milk supply. Mm -hmm. Because that's real life. Like there comes a point in your life where you're like, I feel terrible, but I want to feed my baby. Uh And it's like, but you don't want to feel that terrible because you're not going to be able to keep feeding your baby. Right. So to try something and just see it affects your milk supply and make a decision like, well, I feel so freaking good. It's fine. Like I'll just feed my baby three quarters milk, a breast milk, and then the other quarter I'll have to supplement. Yeah. Like if that's a decision that you make informed, that's fine rather than being surprised and then adding more anxiety to your life that you had a dip in your milk supply, which is not always what I see when patients get put on a mini pill, Mm -hmm. their mini birth control pill. And they said, this should not affect your milk supply, which in theory, I understand that, but it does still sometimes affect your milk supply. And people should just know that. Like you have to know to look for that when you start a mini pill. I understand the textbooks say that it shouldn't, but whenever you're tinkering with your hormones and you're lactating, it can affect your milk supply. It definitely can. Um, But it is, that's why we use it in the postpartum period because it will have less of an impact because it doesn't have that estrogen or kind of synthetic estrogen piece with it. So I think if you really cannot risk getting pregnant, (laughs) then it is, Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's an okay option. Um, But I could do a whole other episode on birth control pills and my thoughts on that. (laughs) Okay. Maybe that's what we do in the future. Not against it completely, but I feel like we we are not educated well as women on what it really does to our body. And so a lot of us just jump on it when we're young and don't realize the repercussions that can happen or just really that there's alternatives out there, you know? Right. Yeah. That is a whole nother episode, which I might end up telling way too much of my health history on this show. If we do that episode, (laughs) so we'll see what the audience wants to hear because, um, yeah, I, I can tell you that I've been significantly positively impacted by your care. I do take, um, progesterone and T3 has made a world of a difference when it comes to anxiety and overall health and metabolism and weight and hair and all of that. So I kind of sound like a postpartum woman, but I'm not, I'm like (laughs) 
perimenopausal or something because yeah, it happens which again. It does overlap quite a bit, honestly. So yeah, which I didn't know. Those are not things like that our families always know a lot about. We know a lot more now than we did before. Right. There's all these scary things about hormone replacement um, in the old literature, and right. you know, there's there's just a lot there to uncover. So I I am just grateful for your expertise in this area and that you gave us your time to explain this little smidget, this little slice yeah. of women's health. Um, this time period that can be really hard to navigate. And I love that you shared a little bit about your experience and how important it is to have that postpartum mental health on board while you're still pregnant to help you mm -hmm. come up with a plan because it's really challenging. It's kind of like what I heard someone say, like when it comes to church, it's like you want to know the scriptures and have them inscribed on your heart before you're in crisis. And when you're in crisis, that that's so not true. the time to, yeah. you know, figure out what's true or what's not true because it's you're so emotional. Yeah. You can't discern the difference. And I think the same is true for your mental health and for some of your hormones. It's really nice to know what you feel like and what they're like when you're feeling well. And then you have your baseline. So when things get a little out of whack, you can more easily pinpoint what yeah. needs to be treated, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and the thing I always go back to and reminding myself and my patients is pregnancy and postpartum are just a season of your life. You know, they are a really important season. They can be a really fun season. But if you are either not loving it or your body is being really funky, it's just a season. And we can work to get you out of it a little bit quicker and with more ease. But just keep reminding yourself, this is not forever. My baby will sleep. I will have a life again. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, will yeah. have my body back eventually. I remember thinking yeah. that I loved breastfeeding, but by the end I was ready. I was ready to be done. I was like, I want yeah. these back. I want them small yeah. again. I don't like having yeah. them. <laughs> so Yeah, I totally get that. I love that. Well, if people wanted to get in touch with you, your new website is Elise Clark Health. Dot com yep. Elise spelled E L I S E mm -hmm. uh, Clark Health.com. And then your Instagram handle is Elise Clark F like family and like nurse P like practitioner. <laughs> um, and you're so generous to give us this promo code, not really a code, but it yeah. says anyone who says they heard about you through the podcast will have $50 off their first appointment. Yeah. So thank you so much for that generous offer. Um, I'm really looking forward to publishing this episode and for people to get the help they need because I am in my mid 40s and I just barely got my mojo back from working yeah. with you and it is worth the investment um otherwise you just end up going to lots of doctor's appointments paying for lots of labs and taking lots of artificial medications that yeah. you don't end up feeling better and it lingers forever like years and years of trying to get right when in a short period of time making a little bit of investment did significantly help me um, to feel better physically and mentally as well. So I appreciate yeah, you, guys, so, you helping I'm with that. I'm so glad. And, and that's the goal is to make these investments in your health initially. So then you have that long-term success and you don't need as many medications and you don't need as many interventions. It's, you know, I want to figure out what's going on in your body and correct that. And then we maintain, you know, no one needs yeah. to take a million pills every day. And using food as nutrition, like, and using like bioavailable supplements and you're mm -hmm. not selling like you're not making money selling supplements so you kind of just tell me what you think is a trustworthy brand i get it wherever i need to get it and if it's working great if my labs look great better which they do then stay with it like vitamin d for me example right. but otherwise don't take a bunch of pills that are going to have lots of side effects you know yeah i'm a big believer in some things you can just grab off the shelf and they might help you help make you feel better and, you know, give you some positive outcomes. But it, to me, it's really about let's look at what your body needs. So you're not taking all these extraneous pills that might not be doing something, but they could be beneficial, but we don't really know. I'm more about let's see the data and then put you on what your body really needs as opposed to taking 30 pills just because there's this <laughs> longevity promise that goes along with it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I love it. It's been fantastic to chat with you. Yes, I you hope too. people reach out to you. Congratulations on your oh, baby that's coming you. soon. Yeah. And I hope that your transition is, you know, you have nice gr grace with yourself and listen back to this episode so you can remind yourself <laughs> that's the, yeah, that's of all the, the goal, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it can be challenging to do all this at one time. But yeah. I appreciate you just your transparency. Of course. I'm always happy to do it. This was fun. Thank you. Maybe we'll connect after your baby and we'll talk yeah. about birth control later, later, once you've recovered. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you so much for being on the show. You're welcome. 
Thanks for listening. To learn more about newborn feeding and get your free swipe file, visit milkdiva.com forward slash newborn feeding. And if you've ever said, wow, I wish I would have known that while you're listening to this podcast, then help a friend out and share this podcast with them. You can also help us by leaving us a rating so more people can benefit from finding this podcast. Medical disclaimer, please know that all opinions expressed on this podcast are solely my own and not intended to substitute the advice of a medical provider. I am not a medical doctor and all information shared is intended for your general knowledge and is geared towards full-term healthy singleton infants and healthy low-risk pregnant or postpartum women.